I'll put this up for your enjoyment. Yeah, that was me coming into school yesterday. Like, oh, ate entirely too much. Good stuff. Hope you had a great holiday. Hope you got to eat plenty. You got a lot of sleep. Hopefully you got to see some family, maybe. Some friends you don't get to hang out with as often. Uh, all kinds of good stuff. Play some games. You know, I, I got to play a lot of video games. Got to play a lot of board games. Had my, all my daughters over with their significant others. Had had a big uh, big feast. And uh, did a little online shopping. I didn't really get out to the stores. I usually like doing that during the Thanksgiving break, but didn't do a whole lot of that. And uh, bought a car. Our car transmission went out, so got another car. All that good stuff. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the break. I put the computer in the corner and didn't touch it and just uh, just enjoyed being off. And then yesterday, it slapped me in the face. It's like, what, I got to go back to school? All right, let me Google that up and see how to get there. You know, so I had to. But I made it. I made it. We're back. We're, we're ready to tackle three and a half weeks. Just about three weeks, really, because that last three days is just like finals days, that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So we are right at the end not much left to go so if we can uh, if we can survive the next three weeks we'll be in in heaven here because if it, we get a nice long break for christmas almost a three-week break for christmas really close to it so if you get your if you get exempt from finals and stuff uh, a lot of your finals could be done early and and certainly have full three weeks so all right Hopefully other folks will be joining us. Not everybody's in here. A lot of people still uh, sleeping off their holiday turkey, I guess. All that tryptophan, right? Isn't that the chemical or whatever? Tryptophan makes you sleepy when you eat too much turkey. I certainly suffered from that. Well, let's take a look. We got uh, we got a bit to cover today. We're going to actually look at some theorems. Theorems. It's like, you know, they come up with these ideas and these thoughts and math. And then uh, we put it out there in the world. It's like, hey, I have this theory that uh, this this equals this. And if you do this and this, it equals that. And then once someone out there in the math world proves it, oh, you're right. Look, and every time you can do this, this, and this, and this, and that is what happens. It becomes a theorem. So we're going to look at some theorems today because that's uh, really what math is, is based on. It's just tons and tons of actual theorems. And you're familiar with some of it already, the Pythagorean theorem. Right, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's a theorem. So we're going to be looking at more theorems today uh, that you may not have heard before. So, all right, let's go to our curriculum. Let's look at our grades as usual to see where we're at. Oh wow, module four. So you should be done with module three. Should have all of the testing done, all the assignments, everything of it. At this point in the semester, if there's anything you're missing, I'll take it. Anything you're missing, go back and get it turned in. And remember, if you were a student that transferred in in the middle of the semester, you can go back and redo things from before you were in virtual. I don't care if you go back and redo module one test. If you got a transfer grade on it that you don't like, go back and do it. Uh, and, and that's true if you've been here all semester. If you had a test grade that you didn't like, Go back and redo it. Go look and see what you missed. And make sure you can do better. If Buzz says you can't redo this, then you can uh, just email me and I will say, okay, Buzz, let them redo that. So absolutely, you can redo things. But we are looking at this week, polynomial long division. Wow, long division. How long has it been since you've done that? And the theorems of algebra. So we got this week and then next week, and then we're uh, at the end of the semester, we'll be doing, I'm thinking I'm going to take the module four test and just wrap it into the final because this class, you can't exempt anyway. You have to take the final in the winter. So uh, since you have to take the final anyway, I can just wrap the module four test in there and not have to do two tests right there at the end because that's no fun taking two tests at the end. So we will look at the, 4.01 today and 4.02. So this would be good to take notes on for the theorems, especially. Yes, Bethany. Um, are you allowed to retake the final or no? 
generally not because because our grades are due for the semester right when the finals are due. You turn in the final and then we have to turn in your grade for the whole semester. So that's why it's good to prepare and study and make sure you got your notes because you can use your notes on the final. I'm good with that. You know, so just be ready for the final because that's usually the one thing you can't retake because we have to turn in grades right after it's done. So, all right, uh, 4.01 polynomial long division. Let's take a look at that. In fact, let's uh, let's review long division before we get into polynomial long division. Let's just review long division as a concept. I'll bring this a little closer. Something we do in general. Okay, so back in grade school, you would divide like six into uh, let's see, one thousand one hundred and ninety-one. We'll just yeah, I'll, put a, I'll put a comma. 1,191. And we're like, okay, long division. This is where we took six doesn't go into one, so we take the two numbers. Six goes into 11 one time. One times six. Remember, we multiply and put it under right there and we subtract. 11 minus six is five. Then you had to bring the next number down. Okay, so how many times does six go into 59? Well, 59 divided by 6 is 9. 9 times 6 was 54. Subtract that. 59 minus 54 is 5. We have to bring the next one down. 1. 51 divided by 6 is 8. 8 times 6 is 48. And we have a remainder of 3. Remainder three. Remember that long division? Ah, boy, those were the good old days before they start throwing X's and Y's in our math and all that good stuff. Woo! Well, this is what we're doing today, but we're doing it with polynomials. Polynomial long division. And you're like, okay, that 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 just seems weird. Yeah, it might, but we're gonna get into it. So all right, let's take a look and see what they're showing us on our lesson. Polynomials in the real world. A cantilever is a beam that's anchored only at one end but can bear weight, like a crane at the top. See, it's only anchored right on here, but it can bear some weight. It has a, you know, a counterweight over here. And these beams are used in a lot of applications, from bridges to airplanes to microelectromechanical systems. Well, there's a good word, microelectrical mechanical. Try that in Scrabble. Get a lot of points for that. The amount of bending a cantilever undergoes is a third degree polynomial function based on the cantilever's length. So they use polynomial functions out in the real world, uh, engineers especially. Uh, and a lot of real world solutions can be modeled using these functions. So that's why we need to know how to use functions. And one thing that's really important is when polynomial functions equal zero. So that's usually at the breaking point or the, you know, point where it's going to work or not going to work depending on what you're dealing with so all right so we're going to learn how long division can be used to find factors of polynomial functions and we're going to divide polynomials by a monomial when you first when you first learn long division you probably didn't really understand what it was used for but now that you're older and wiser you can see knowing how to divide helps a lot in in life you know like you got a part-time job at a bakery bakery sells a bag of rolls with 13 rolls, which is called a baker's dozen, or maybe they just sell 12, a regular dozen. If the baker made 158 rolls before they left and they want to make sure that each roll is packaged for being going home, you got to know how many bags you need. So you'd have to divide 158 by 13 to know how many bags you're going to use. We do division all the time. Uh, there's additional review on long division if you need another example on how we use long division. Uh, there's the terminology. You have the divisor, that's what you're dividing into something. The dividend is what's being divided into, and the quotient is what you get when you divide. So uh, 158 would be the dividend, you divide by 13, and that tells you how many bags the quotient would be, the bags, which would be, where's the answer? 12, 12 bags. And you'd have two rolls left over, which I guess you could eat. So there you go. All right, the steps used to divide polynomials are the same as used when dividing integers. 
They give you this little acronym, Discovering Math Solutions Bring Rewards, which stands for Division, Multiplication, Subtraction, Bring Down the Next Number, and Repeat. So let's look at how to do this. So we're going to start with this one right here. We're going to do it on paper. You have a video you can watch that you can go back and review later. But I'm going to go ahead and do this on paper first with our 2x divided into 2x to the third minus 10x squared plus 18x. Okay. Got that written down on my paper. Long division using polynomials. Same steps that we did over here. First, you see how many times 6 went into 11. So 11 divided by 6 was 1. How many times does 2x go into 2x to the third? If we divide that, we get x squared. And then what we do, we took 1 times 6 and put it underneath there. So x squared times 2x is 2x to the third. Then we subtracted the 6. So we're subtracting this. 2x to the third minus 2x to the third. Oh, that's 0. So we have to bring down the next term, just like we did over there. So now we have negative 10x squared. All right, so we're dividing that by 2x. So it goes in there, negative 5x times because 10x squared negative 10x squared divided by 2x is negative 5x now we multiply this negative 10x squared when you take negative 5x times 2x and we're subtracting that we're subtracting a negative which means we add it basically negative 10x squared plus 10x squared zero bring down the next term How many times when you divide 18x by 2x does it go in? Nine. Multiply. Subtract that remainder of zero. So when we divide 2x into 2x to the third minus 10x squared plus 18x, we get x squared minus 5x plus 9. Since the remainder is zero, I'm going to start teaching you this theorem early. Since the remainder is zero, this is a factor of this. So we can write 2x times x squared minus 5x plus 9. And that is the factors of the original equation. Now, this will factor even further, but it's quadratic. It's easier to factor quadratic. We know several ways to do that. Factoring, completing the square, quadratic formula all that good stuff that we can do to factor quadratics but the first thing we had to find out is what's the first factor since the remainder is zero this is a factor that's what tells us yes that's a factor otherwise we'd have a remainder and then we wouldn't consider this a factor we can still divide it and end up with a remainder in fact we will be doing that we will have a remainder in several of these but this is how long division works now, this is just a monomial, mono, one, one term. We're going to do some that has more than one term. So we're going to get to that shortly. But you can watch this video. It's four minutes and 42 seconds. And you see when they get to the end of it, x squared minus 5x plus 9 with no remainder. All right. And here's more on that. If you need another example on polynomials being divided by a monomial, Here's where they divide negative 3x and they, they break down the steps right there. So, and then another example down here where they divide by 6x squared. So, all right, I'm not going to look at more than monomials because we're going to get into the bigger ones. Polynomial division of a polynomial by a polynomial. All right, so here's another one. We'll do this one on paper together x minus 6 divided into x squared minus 2x plus 4. All right. So now, since we have two terms, this is a binomial, right? We have an x and a minus 6. Oh, it's not focusing. Focus. Come on, thing. It, it's just not happy. There we go. Get better. Get better. So we just look at the first term when we're trying to divide in here. 
not the x minus x, but just the x. How many times does x go into x squared? Right? Well, it goes in x number of times. x squared divided by x. So then we multiply x times this. x times x is x squared. x times negative 6 is negative 6x. All right? So what we did, we took the first term and divided it. x squared divided by x is x. And then when we multiply it, we have to multiply it by the entire divisor. So it's x squared minus 6x. And remember, we subtract this. All of this is being subtracted from what's above it. x squared minus x squared. Well, that's nothing. Negative 2x minus negative 6x. 4x. Right? Because remember, negative 2 minus negative 6. If you subtract a negative, that's just like adding. That's positive 4. So negative 2x minus a negative 6x is a positive 4x. Bring the next term down. How many times does x go into 4x? Four times. Multiply. Four times x. Four times negative 6. Subtracting. If you make a mistake in long division, it's going to be here. Subtracting. Because when you look at this, you think, okay, that goes away, and 4, negative 24 is negative 20. No, we're subtracting. We're subtracting the negative 24. And when we subtract the negative, that means we add. So the remainder is 28. So this is not a factor. If you're factoring this quadratic equation, this is not one of the factors because we have a remainder. There's a remainder. So the answer, though, if you divide this by this, what's the answer? The answer is x plus 4 plus 28x minus 6s. You take the remainder and put it over the divisor. Here, how many times does 6 go into 1191? It goes 198 and uh, 3 six times, or 1 half. 198 and a half. That's how many times 6 goes in there, because there's 3 left over. It's a half. Same thing here, 28 x minus 6s. So that is the answer when you divide this into that. See what they have with their video. Their video is three minutes and 50 seconds. Let me get down to the end of that. X plus four plus 28 X minus sixes. So if you want to watch that video and let them work through that again, like I just did, and their explanation may be exactly the same. It may be a little different, but you can watch the video to see that again on how you divide X minus six into that quadratic equation. Okay, this is another way of saying it. I, I like this one too. All right, so we're going to give you f of x. f of x is 9x squared plus 6. And g of x is 3x minus 1. And they want to know f of x divided by g of x. All right, this one has a little twist. There's something different about this. They gave us f of x, 9x squared plus 6. They gave us g of x, 3x minus 1. And they want to know, find f of x divided by g of x. Okay, well, that's, that's just long division. f of x divided by g of x. But here's the thing when you divide. You have to have the terms in order. You have to have the x to the third, the x to the second, the x. You have to have... The x squared, the x, the constant. Here, what do we have? We have the x squared and the constant. Where's the x term? We're missing the x term. That's going to create a problem if we divide, if we don't account for the x term. How many x's are there in this equation? Well, there's 9x squared. And we've got to have an x term. 
How many X's? Well, there's there's zero. There's no X's. That's why they didn't put it in that. We ne we don't write an equation like that. If there's zero X's, why write it? There's also zero X to the third and zero X to the fourth and zero X to the fifth. So if we're putting all the zeros in there, this equation, I mean, this function can be huge. So that's why we never write that when we just write what the function is. But when we divide, we have to have that in there or we're going to have a wrong answer. And we can look at that. Let's, let, let's actually play with that and see what happens if we don't do that. 9x squared plus 6. We divide 3x into 9x. It goes in 3x amount of times. So that's 9x squared minus 3x. When we multiply it back. When we try to subtract that, this subtracts out. But this is 6 minus 3x. We can't combine those. Um, or we can put it in the same order. I guess we put the x first. Negative 3x plus 6. And then we can try to divide this. Uh, that goes in negative 1 times. There's negative 1 times that is negative 3x uh, plus 1. 3x minus 1, that, that subtract that. So that's a remainder of 5, because 6 minus 1. So it says 3x minus 1, 3x minus 1 times 3x minus 1 plus 5 3x minus 1s. That should multiply together to be 9x squared plus 6. Hmm. Well, let's see. If we distribute, that's going to be a mess, isn't it? Hmm. Because we got a plus 5 on the end. Because this will cancel out with that when you multiply that term. But these doesn't cancel out. So you get like 9x squared we take it times 3x minus 3x. We multiply that times the negative 1. You got a minus 3x again, plus 1. And then you got the plus 5. Uh, now we're getting 9x squared minus 6x plus 6. We got a middle term when we multiplied it back together. We didn't end up with 9x squared plus 6. We ended up with 9x squared minus 6x plus 6. So something wrong. This, this is not the factors. 3x minus 1, no, made that real small, plus 5, 3x minus 1. So this is wrong. And it's wrong because we have to account for the middle term, the 0x. This ought to turn out differently. Let's see. 3x goes into 9x squared. It does go in 3x amount of times because when we divide 9 divided by 3 is 3. x squared divided by x is x. Multiply. 9x squared minus 3x. Subtract. This cancels out. 0 minus negative 3. So this is a positive 3x. 0 minus negative 3. And uh, let's see. This is brought down plus 6. 3x goes in 3x one time. 3x minus 1. Subtract that. 3x minus 3x goes away. 6 minus negative 1. Remainder of 7. So 3x minus 1 and 3x plus 1 plus 7. 3x minus 1. So when we divide this into there, this is our answer. That's what we get. That's what's left. 3x plus 1 plus 7 3x minus 1s. Have to account for any missing terms. Missing terms. It's not there. It's not there. Have to account for missing terms. So that's what they're doing in this one down here. See, they write 9x squared plus 0x plus 6. 
got to have all the terms. Then they, then they go through all the steps that we just did. Bring down, repeat, 3x plus 1 plus 7, 3x minus 1. Same thing we just got. What would happen if 0x is not be included? Well, we looked at that, and we come up with this whole problem that you can't really subtract that. It doesn't work. We tried to try to make it work. It, it, it's a mess because it should always go together, but they're being combined in bad. It doesn't work. Okay. So again, oh, I would point out again, since this had a remainder, this is not a factor. This is not a factor of that quadratic equation. If we factor this quadratic equation, we will not get that as one of the factors because there's a remainder. All right, let's let's actually use a live problem here that you might apply this for in real life, theoretically. If we have a box, we know the volume of a box is length times width times height. Right now, we find the volume. So, if we know the length and the width, and we know the volume, we can find the height. So, it says the volume equals x to the third, oh, move my mouse, plus 4x squared minus 31x minus 70. And the length is x plus 7 and the width is x minus 5. Okay, so down here kind of get that line brighter there. All right, we have the volume of the box represented by this function right here. x to the third plus 4 x squared minus 31 x minus 70. We have the length and the width x plus 7, x minus 5. If we divide, because we know the volume equals length times width times height, we have the length and the width. If we divide the length and the width, volume divided by length and the width equals the height. If we're trying to find the height. All we have to do is divide the volume by the length and the width. So there's two ways to do that. First, we could take this and divide this into it. And then whatever's left over, we'll divide this into it. Or we can multiply these together. We can take length times width and then divide it in. So let's do that way. It should save us a step. We take x plus 7 and multiply it times x minus 5. x times x is x squared. x times negative 5. Negative 5x. Five it's all right, Justice. You made it back. Plus 7x and negative 35. So this is x squared plus 2x minus 35. Agreed? When we multiply this times this, we get this quadratic equation. So that's right there, length times width. So if we divide that into the volume, that'll give us the height. So let's do that. Set that up x squared plus 2x minus 35 divided into do we have all the terms x to the third x squared x okay we don't have to add any zero terms all right so we're doing long division again when we have multiple terms we just look at the first one x to the third divided by x squared. Well, that's just x. I can put it down here at the end because we're going to go all in here. Anywhere you want to put it up there, it really doesn't matter. x times x squared is x to the third. x times 2x, 2x squared. x times negative 35, negative 35x. Now remember, we're subtracting all of those terms x third minus x third. Those cancel each other out. 4x squared minus a 2x squared. 2x squared. Negative 31x minus a negative 35. Minus negative 35 we're adding, so we get plus 4x. 
and then we bring down the next term. All right, how many times does x squared go into 2x squared? Well, just two times. And the positive two, positive two times. Two times x squared. Two times 2x. Two times negative 35. Oh, look at there. If we're subtracting that, all the terms are the same. Subtract, subtract, subtract. Remainder of zero. So there's our answer. The height equal x plus 2. The length is x plus 7. The width is x minus 5. And the height is x plus 2. We found the three dimensions of the box that have this volume. So that means those are the three factors. If we multiply those three things together, x plus 2 times x plus 7 times x minus 5, that will give us this equation right here because that's, that's the three factors. Those are the factors. Because we've got a remainder of zero, we know that is one of the factors. And this is what those two equal multiplied times each other. So that's how we use long division to find factors. Anytime there's a remainder of zero, it's a factor we can divide out. So, all right, let's go back and see what else it talks about in here. Applied long division. Oh, and I guess they want us to give our answer. Our answer was x plus 2. Yay, we found the height. If you struggle with that, it'll show you how to do that. There's the long division we just did. High of the box is x plus 2. All right. And the lesson summary. So that's the end of this lesson. Polynomial long division lesson. It's good because we want to get to the theorems. But there's the steps. Divide, multiply, subtract, bring down, repeat. Just like you do with numbers. So, and look, x to the fourth minus 1 you got to put in the x to the third, the x squared, and the x, and they're all zero terms. If you're dividing, you got to include those. And that's true whether it's the divisor or the dividend, either one. Anytime you're missing, if you're doing long division and you're missing anything, you have to include those zero terms. Even if it's outside, if it's the number you're dividing into, if we're dividing x squared minus 1 into something, we have to do x squared plus 0x minus 1. All right. They do have some practice problems. They have two pages of practice problems for you to do where they give you the answers and see, see if you're correct. So if you're not sure, okay, this looks confusing, Mr. Brock. Okay, we'll try this one. Do this and say, if I divide that by 5, what do I get? I get that. It says, that's correct. What's the next one? Can you divide that by 7x? What do you get? Divide this by 7x. Which one does it get? Wow, every time I highlight it, it moves it down the line. That's cool. That by 7x. Uh, well, let's see. I think I get uh, that right there, right, Mr. Brook? Yep. Divide by 9x and 30. And then there's the second set here where you're dividing by a binomial, x plus 7. Check my work. It'll tell you how to do it. So you can make sure when you do it on paper, did you get it right? Yeah. Yep, that's the same thing I got. That's what you want to do. Check, see if you get it right. There's three problems there. And the next page has more practice. Uh, match each division problem to square quotient. So you have six different math problems to do. Divide this by four and which one of those is that like uh let's see is it that one yes it is divide this by 6x which one of those is that uh, is it that one so get lots of practice there six of them and then there's two more screens after this so that's one of three so it's got all the practice you want do you have to do all of them no if you do enough of them there's a okay i know what i'm doing then move on and do the assignment to make sure you understand the assignment has Dividing by 7x, uh, dividing f of x by g of x. g of x is 3x squared. Uh, dividing by x minus 4. Dividing by 2x plus 5. And then here's another one of those volume. 
where it gives you the volume equation and it gives you the width and the height. So you got to divide those, multiply those together, divide it into that to figure out which one of these is the length. Five problems. You can do that. As long as you practice in the lesson, you shouldn't have any trouble with the assignment. If you do, come see me Thursday. All right, theorems of algebra. Let's get into the theorems. All right, you've heard of the Pythagorean theorem. See, a theorem is a statement, which is not necessarily mathematical in, in nature. There's theorems that aren't math theorems. There's lots of science theorems and physics theorems, all kinds of stuff. But it's proven by experimentation. In math, they, they use other proven theorems to prove new theories to make theorems. So we're going to learn three important theorems that help us work with polynomial equations. Three theorems today. So what key features of a polynomial can be found using the fundamental theorem of algebra? That's one. And the factor theorem and the remainder theorem. So there's our three theorems we're going to add to our notes. Uh, this talks about factoring a quadratic, and you know we did that last unit. We looked at quadratics. We can use a quadratic formula. We can complete the square. We can factor it. We can graph it. We can look at the discriminant, the b squared minus 4ac, and if that's a perfect square, then we know we're going to have two rational solutions. But none of that is the fundamental theorem of algebra. I love it. You look at that and it's like, what's the step to the fundamental? No, that has nothing to do with the fundamental theorem of algebra. I'll tell you what it has to do with the fundamental theorem of algebra. They're talking about it down here. But I'm going to put it very simply on paper. Instead of trying to go through the way they're trying to prove it, because, heck, I even get kind of confused the way they're trying to prove it. It's like, what, what are you saying? I don't know what you're saying. I'm going to show you it. Fundamental... Theorem of Algebra. My pencil is getting dull. Right. Here it is. This is great for your notes. Because you'll probably have a question on the assignment or on the test. And, oh, let me just tell you. This fundamental theorem of algebra question is the easiest question I'm going to ask all year. And yet I have people miss it. I had this in, in Algebra 3. We did the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra. And over half the class missed it. And I can tell you why they missed it. Because they're trying to look up my questions online. And they're trying to go have somebody else answer it for them. And I changed the questions. I changed the questions. And they don't notice that. And they put the old answer from what the question used to be before I changed it. And missed the easiest question I'm going to ask all year. All right. Why is it the easiest? I'm going to show you why it's the easiest question. And you're going to get this real quick. All right, so if I put up some uh, functions, let me put let me put uh, 3x to the 10th minus 4x to the 8th plus 5x to the 4th minus 3x squared plus x minus 1. And I'm going to put another one up. I'm going to put uh, 4x to the 5th minus... 4x to the 4th plus 4x to the 3rd minus 7. And I'm going to put uh, 2x squared minus 3x minus 9. And let's do one more for the, just for the fun of it. x to the 28th minus 4x to the 23rd uh plus 17 x to the 20th plus 4 x to the fourth minus 2 x squared plus 19. you're like what in the world are you writing mr brock i'm going to illustrate the fundamental theory of algebra the fundamental theory of algebra tells you how many solutions are there when we factor this how many solutions Let's start with the one you know. 2x squared minus 3x minus 9. That's a quadratic equation. How many solutions are there to a quadratic equation? I'm going to let you put that in the chat. 
how many equations are there? I mean, how many solutions are there for a quadratic equation? We're going to get x equals, right, x equals 5 and x equals 9. You know, how many x's do we expect with a quadratic solution? Because we've worked a lot with quadratics. Can use the discriminant. The discriminant, good question, Sean. The discriminant will tell you whether they're real solutions, whether they're rational solutions, whether they're imaginary solutions. But the discriminant doesn't tell you how many solutions. But that's a very good question. Now, remember, when we do the quadratic formula, you end up with that negative b plus or minus, whatever the discriminant is divided by 2a. With a quadratic equation, we always end up with two solutions. Sometimes they're the same solution. Maybe it's x equals 1, x equals 1. Because if we factor it, if we have x squared, uh, let's see, plus x minus 6. That factors to x minus 2 times x minus 3. And the solutions are x equals 2 and negative 3. Because that factors to these. Oh, wait a minute. X plus 3. Yeah. X minus 2, x plus 3. And this is solutions. There are two solutions. And that's true for every quadratic. Sometimes they're imaginary solutions. Sometimes when we do the quadratic formula, we end up with, oh, the uh, solution is 3 uh, plus or minus the square root of uh, 20. 3 over 5. But that's still two solutions. One of the solutions is 3 plus the square root of 23 divided by 5. The other one is 3 minus the square root of 23 divided by 5. There's two solutions because it's a quadratic. What tells us is that x squared. Whatever the largest exponent is, is how many solutions it has. The largest exponent. A quadratic has this. If we have just uh, x minus 6 equals 4, how many solutions does that have? One. There's only one possible solution, which is x equals 10, right? 10 minus 6 equals 4. That's the only possible is This is x to the first. The largest exponent is a 1, so there's one solution. The largest exponent is a 2. There's two solutions. Take a guess at how many solutions this one has. 3x to the 10th minus x, 4, 8, minus 4x to the 8th plus 5x to the 4th plus 3x squared plus x plus 1. Take a guess in the chat on how many solutions. Let me underline block all these others. Take a guess on how many solutions that one has. I'll tell you if you're right. Don't make it complicated. What did we say about these? We said this had two. This had two because x squared. This had one because it's x to the first. Here, let me let me let me point to this. Two solutions. One solution. Okay. I, I think I'm okay. Uh, I it's determined I, by the exponent. I, I, you, Sean, you've got it. The largest exponent tells us yeah, how many solutions there are. I don't care about any coefficient. I don't care about any of these other x's. I just care about the biggest exponent. That has 10 solutions. How many does that have? Sean says five. Anyone agree with that? That thing says five. That's a quadratic equation, right? We know that has two. How many does that one have? Well, I don't 
See what I'm saying about this could be the easiest question I ask you all year. I could give you this big, nasty, long equation. I can give you one much bigger than that. I could have every term, X to 28, X to 27, X to 26. I could have one that has 28, 29 terms on it and ask you how many solutions does it have? And you don't even have to do any math. You can just look at it right away and go, oh, that has 28. Don't look that up. That's silly to look that up because it is that easy. It's not a trick question. That is the fundamental theorem of algebra. Fundamental theorem of algebra says the largest exponent is the number of solutions. Now, if we found those solutions, it may be that some of those are imaginary solutions. Some of those may repeat. Maybe x equals 7 shows up four times. Maybe four of those 28 solutions are all x equals 7, x equals 7, x equals 7, x equals 7. That's okay. It may not be 28 unique solutions, but there are 28 solutions, 28 X's. You factor that to 28 different binomials or monomials. So that's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Write that in your notes, however you're going to remember that. But it's just that simple. Maybe put some examples like this. So you know... But it is that simple, the fundamental theorem of algebra. How do people miss that in the test? Well, they go to look this up. And maybe I go in and I go in to buzz and I said, I'm going to change this and I'm going to make this a nine. And I make that a nine. And they look this up and everything looks identical because nothing changes except the exponent. And so they go, oh, that's it. I found it online. Somebody answered it for me online. It's 28 but not paying attention to the fact this is not a 28 because I changed it. I made it a 29. It looked a lot like the same and they get the answer wrong. Why are you looking it up at all, right? This is the easiest question. There's no need to try to look up my answers. You should know how to do it. You should do that with me with all of them. I change a lot of questions on Buzz. I don't leave the original questions. I change a lot of them, mainly on tests. I don't do it all the time on these little five question quizzes. I don't care as much about that, but the tests, I want to make sure you know what you're doing. So I changed these questions. And this one is a very, very simple thing. All right. I wanted to emphasize that when to walk through it because I hate when people miss very, very simple things. This theorem states that the number of zeros, either real or imaginary, is equal to the degree of the polynomial. And the degree of the polynomial is decided by the largest exponent. All right. This is a third degree polynomial right here because it's x to the third. So that means there's three solutions. And when you graph this, you can th see three solutions. There's three places where it crosses the x-axis. Okay, so, so that 28th power one, if we graph that, I, I don't know if we'd cross 28 times because I didn't put all those extra terms in there. If I had put 27th and 26th and 25th and 24th, all those, it'd probably have 28 places that crosses the x-axis. Unless some of those are imaginary. All right. Uh, I love this. Here's a whole video on determining the zero. So this is this is just a factoring quadratic equation. So I'm not going to go through it. Two and a half minutes on factoring a quadratic. Make it bigger. They come down to the solutions are uh, negative four and seven. We knew there would be two solutions because it's x squared. It's a two. So there's two solutions. Turns out they're negative four and seven. But this was just a factoring a quadratic. So this is really review from what we did before, just review. All right, show more on the fundamental theorem of algebra. What more could there be? Let's see what else they're telling us. Oh, this is good. Okay, all right. We do need to look at this. What more is there? Uh, there is, it's not really more. It's just, you might get confused if you don't think about it. If f of x, equals x minus 1 times 3x plus 4 times 2x squared minus 7. This is factored form, right? Because this is the factors. 
I didn't give it to you in standard form. This is standard form up here when it goes from largest to smallest. So how many solutions? This could be considered a trick question. Could be considered a trick question. It's not really, but I didn't give it to you in standard form. This works in standard form. What's standard form? That means all of it's been multiplied together. You've got the whole equation. It's in largest to smallest. Standard form. This is not standard form. This is factored form. Hmm. So how many solutions are there? So let's think about that. Our instinct is to say, oh, is there two? Because there's a, there's a two right there. But that's not exactly right because this is factored form. If I made this in the standard form, I'd have to multiply these together, multiply those together, and then multiply that one times whatever those together are, right? So uh, let's uh, let's let's do that. X minus one times three x plus four. So we distribute the x. X times three x is three x squared. X times four is four x. Negative one times three x. Negative one times four. So that's 3x squared plus x, because those are like terms, minus 4. And then I would multiply that times 2x squared minus 7. Because I just took these two and multiplied them together to be that. All right, so this is the same equation. I've just taken two of the factors and multiplied them together. And I can do the same thing here. So have you got any idea how many solutions there are yet? Any thought, any guesses? I'll take guesses at this point. Because some of y'all might be on the track. Some of you might have it. Oh, I'm seeing some guesses. So if we multiply these together, it'd probably be easier to put this one in front because there's only two terms, but we can distribute this way. That's right. Let's take the 3x. 3x squared plus 2x squared is 6x to the fourth. Oh, that's going to be the biggest term, right? Because all these others are going to be smaller. 3x squared times negative 7, 21x squared. x times 2x squared, that's going to be 2x to the third. x times negative 7, negative 7x. Negative 4 is negative 8x squared. Negative 4 times that plus 28. Combine like terms. Let's see, we've got a 6x to fourth. Uh, we got one 3x. 2x to the third. Uh, we've got two of these, negative 21 and negative 8. So negative 29x squared. We've only got one x term. And we've got a 28. This is the same equation in standard form. And look, your guesses there are four solutions. How would we know that from the factored form? Well, here's the easiest way to do that. What's the largest exponent here? One. What's the largest exponent here? One, and this one has a two. We can just take the, the term, the largest one from each factor and add those together. Because that's what's going to happen when you multiply them. They're going to get multiplied together, and this will be a x squared, because a one and a one would become a two. When we multiply it over here, it's going to be a four now. So you can just add those together and not have to do all this work. So if we had uh, x squared minus 4 times x times 3x to the third hey, plus x plus 1, 
we can look at that and know right away there are six solutions because you've got a third, a squared, and a single all being multiplied together. When they multiply together, you'll end up with an x to the sixth as your largest exponent. So factor form isn't really any more difficult than standard form. Standard form is just super easy. I'm just looking for the biggest exponent. This one, I just got to figure out what would the biggest exponents be. So I just take the biggest one from each factor and add them together. Two plus one plus three. Okay, that's six. That's not that's not any harder. Basic addition. So don't get confused if if something like this. Generally, the problem that I've had missed is the one like this. I give you an equation like this, and and they'll miss it. So this is the fundamental theorem of algebra. It is the most basic theorem of algebra to know how many solutions you're looking for when you try to solve an equation. So that's what this one is. This is a factored form. And these are all x. x minus 13, x minus 18, x plus 9. Three solutions. There's one for there, one for there, one for there. And they went ahead and worked them. It's 13, 18, and negative 9. That's the three solutions. When you graph it, you can see it because they're all real. None of them are imaginary. They're all real solutions. So, yes, add the x's. All right. Let's look at, see. We need our next theorem. We got we got three theorems to cover. We're getting one. This one, we have kind of gotten into it already. The factor theorem. All right, so in order to understand the factor theorem, you got to understand what a factor is, right? A factor is something that'll divide into something else without a remainder. Like when you take a quadratic and you factor it, you can only do that if it factors nicely with no remainders. So when we did this problem on the other page, and we found out that dividing 2x into that as a remainder zero, we said this is a factor. This is a factor, and this is the other factor. And this would factor further. We can we can factor that more. It's going to be not an integer solution, but yeah. These are factors. Six is not a factor of 1,191 because there's a remainder. When we did this, x minus six is not a factor of that because there's a remainder. Dang it. 3x minus one is not a factor of 9x squared plus six because there's a remainder. Right? So when we did that and there's no remainder, X plus two was a factor of the original because there's no remainder. So what is a remainder? That means that means it divides evenly. It divides evenly in there. So really, we've already talked about the factor theorem. Let's see, do they give it more factor theorem? It doesn't say anything on that. Is X minus two a factor of this? All you have to do is divide it. Divide x minus 2 into it and see, is the remainder 0? If the remainder 0, yes, it's a factor. This one says, no, this one is not either. x minus 7 is not a factor. So the factor theorem, and we'll write that down for having our notes. Factor theorem. If you um, so I took off on divide a polynomial, polynomial into another polynomial, and the remainder. Is zero the I, I guess I should say the first polynomial. Is a factor of the second. If that makes sense. If you divide a polynomial into another polynomial and the remainder is zero, the first polynomial is a factor of the second. 
if I could write that more clearly, but maybe I can't. This is the factor theorem. So we've been talking about the factor theorem all day today because I was talking about that in the first lesson because I knew we was going to get into this. If you divide a polynomial and the remainder is zero, it's a factor. So that's how you can tell if something is a factor or another without, you know, does this factor well? Let me see, is that a factor? I can divide it and find out yes or no. Factor theorem. All right. And they give you some examples of that, of, you know, is this a factor of that? So they go through and they divide it. So let's see, set up the division. Yep, look, when you divide this into that, it comes down to a remainder of zero. So that is a factor, and that's the other factor. You can multiply those two together and get this same equation back. So that's how you check that. You just divide it and see if your remainder is zero. So the factor theorem is not hard to understand. You just may struggle with the long division if you don't practice enough. If you practice enough, the long division is not too hard. All right, what other theorem do we have today? We said there was three. The remainder theorem. Oh, yes, I like the remainder theorem. Okay, and, and the way they say the remainder theorem is a little awkward. Just a little awkward. Uh, let's, let's go over the remainder theorem using some of the examples that we've already looked at. So I'm going to go back to what we've done over here. Uh, and I'm going to do this one. Okay. So we took this original function. We'll write this function then that we used. 2x. Oh, no, it wasn't a 2x. Well, I'm already writing down the wrong function. Okay, our function was x squared minus 2x plus 4. All right, so we're, we're talking about the uh, remainder theorem. I'm spelling that different every time I spell it. That should be it. Remainder theorem. And we checked to see was x minus 6. When we divided that, We divided that, it had a remainder of 28. 28 was our remainder. And we checked that by long division. Well, the remainder theorem has a different way to check this. So we said this was not a factor. So the remainder theorem says there's another way to check to see if that's a factor. If we take what x equals, like if we take this, and it says take the opposite of this. If we set that equal to zero, what is x? Well, if we add six to both sides, x equals six, right? So for x minus six, if we set equal to zero, x equals six. If we take the six, and substitute it into our equation. We're going to take that 6. So this is 6 squared minus 2 times 6 plus 4. Right? Same equation. It's just instead of x, I'm putting in a 6. So it's 6 squared minus 2 times 6 plus 4. So what does that equal? 6 squared is 36. 2 times 6 is 12 plus 4. So f of 6 equals 36 minus 12 is 24 plus 4, 28. Hey, Billy, I'm wow. Know. Wait a minute. I've seen that number before. This gave us the same number as dividing x minus 6 into the equation, into the function. We divided x minus 6 got a remainder of 28. So if we just took the 6 and substituted it into the equation, 
We're still in number 28. Hey, let's look at another one, Mr. Brock. Let's see what else we got. Um, have we done one that I can play with and use? Yeah, I want to pull a different. I'll pull a different one. Let's do a different one. Let's see what they have in here that we uh, can play with too. Oh, so they did these. X plus 2 and X plus 9 is what it factored to. And they divided it by X plus 9. And it had a remainder of 0. So using theirs, their function was X squared plus 11X plus 18. And when they divided X plus 9... Remainder of zero. Uh, so Billy, in your email, I you when they divided x plus nine right here on the right into x squared plus eleven x plus eighteen, so it ended up with a remainder of zero. Um, I sent you the username. I remainder of zero. So if we take this x plus nine, instead of equal to zero, x would be negative nine. Right, we take the opposite of that number. That's a positive nine. We take the negative nine. This was a minus six. We took a positive six. We take the opposite of that number and we substitute it in nine squared plus 11 times nine plus 18. Oh, negative nine. Ooh. Negative nine. Negative nine squared plus 11 times negative nine plus 18. So this equals negative nine times negative nine is 81 plus, oh, that's a minus because we got a, a negative nine times a positive 11. That's a negative 99. And then we've got a plus 18. Let's do the plus first. 81 plus 18 is 99 minus 99. Oh, so F of negative nine equals zero. So that means that f plus 9 is a factor, or x plus 9, I mean. x plus 9 is a factor because that a remainder of 0. The other one they, they did, they also divided x plus 2 and got a remainder of 0. That was the other one they did right there. They divided x plus 2 on the left side, and it got a remainder of 0 because those are the two factors. But we could also have test f of... of Let's see if that's x plus two. We take the opposite number, so x would be negative two. Negative two squared plus eleven times negative two plus eighteen. Negative two times negative two is four. Negative negative two times eleven is negative twenty-two plus eighteen. Well, that also equals zero. So that tells us these are the two solutions. These are the two solutions. The factors would be x plus 9 and x plus 2, right? But when we do that, we find the solutions by setting those equal to 0, like we did there. So the remainder theorem, the remainder theorem says if we substitute in, Uh, I don't like the way they say it in there, but I want you to understand it. If this is a factor, you take the opposite of the number. X plus 9, we take the negative 9. If we substitute in a, I'm going to put a number. And the function equals zero. That number is a solution. Hey, Taylor, I'm going to need you on your Chromebook.
If we were to graph this, in fact, let's graph this. The solutions are always where it crosses the x-axis. This x squared plus 11x plus 18, negative 2, negative 9. We said those would be the two solutions. It is. That's the zeros, the solutions, negative 2 and negative 9. Because when we substitute those in, negative 9 and negative 2, we got 0 both times. Negative 9 is 0. F of negative 2 is 0. Those are the solutions. Those are the zeros. And that tells us the factors. If it was negative 9, x plus 9 must be the factor. If it's negative 2, x plus 2 must be the factor. This is the remainder theorem. And it also would be the same thing if we divided that into it. That's also what the remainder is. Like when we divided x minus 6, the remainder is equal to the same number that we substitute in. Pretty cool. All right. See how they phrase that in our text today. It's a little bit confusing. When the opposite of the constant term of the binomial, that's the way they say that. The opposite, like x plus 6, the constant term is plus 6, so you're substituting negative 6. When the opposite of the constant term of the binomial is substituted for x in the function, the result's equal to the remainder. All right? It's equal to the remainder. That's what the theorem showed us, is that when we did that, when we took the opposite of the constant, the constant was negative 6, and we substituted 6 in, the result is the same as the remainder. So those are all related to the remainder theorem right there. We take the opposite of that and substitute it in. It's going to be the same as the remainder. That's that's what I really want you to get out of that. And that also tells us that's the solutions. If it's zero, if it's zero. All right, so the remainder theorem tells us this. If you have a polynomial function and a number, like 6, then if x minus 6 is a factor, then 6 is a 0. That's what we proved that. x minus 6, well, in this case, x minus x plus 9, so negative 9 was a 0. You can use long division to prove that or using factoring methods to solve that. If a is a 0, then the graph crosses at that 0 substituting a into x minus a will equal zero and substituting it into f of x will equal zero. All those things there. We see that negative nine work right there. It equals on the graph, it crosses the axis at negative nine. When we substitute it into x plus a, or x minus, x minus minus nine, x plus nine, that equals zero. And substituting the negative nine into the equation equals zero. All those things are pulled from that remainder theorem. Here's one for you to practice. Find the remainder when this is divided by this. You can do that with division or substitution. All right? If you don't want to divide that, then take negative 10 and substitute it in. You take the opposite of the constant. Substitute negative 10 in, and it'll give you the remainder. All right. And that's the lesson summary. That's the end of the lesson, which is good because we're running out of time anyway. All right, fundamental theorem of algebra, factor theorem, remainder theorem. That's the three theorems we looked at. We'll look at the assignment that goes with that real quick. Oh, according to the fundamental theorem of algebra, how many zeros does this function have? There you go, very first question. You don't have to solve anything. You just look at it and give an answer. Uh, which of the following is a zero for this function? Oh, that's a good one because it's in factored form. So you should be able to look at those factors and say, okay, if I put negative seven in, would that make that equal to zero? Is that a factor? That shouldn't be too much work. Is this a factor of that? All right. So you can do long division or you can substitute that eight positive eight in and see, is it a factor? 
Is the remainder zero or not? Find the remainder when you divide X minus five into this equation. They don't want to know everything. They just want to know what is the remainder. And obviously there's going to be one and another one. So you have five questions all dealing with uh, remainders and all of that good stuff that we just talked about. So there you go. Whew. Theorems, theorems. When algebra three learned it, they had to learn. I think we did five theorems. I know we did four. So we'll add another theorem when you get to algebra three next year. If you take algebra three next year, you got options. It's not required. So, all right, guys. Uh, you got about uh, 20, 25 minutes to get your grade checks done before advisory if you wanted to, because uh, that, that's coming up next. But anyway, have a great week. It is an A Friday, so we only have class on Thursday. So if you need help, come see me. If your grade's below 70, you need to come see me or you'll be counted absent. So get your grade above 70 or I'll see you Thursday. Have a great week.